Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. And you know how you're not supposed to have favorites? Well, I have my one of my very favorite co-workers with me here today, Melinda Hickman. Aww. Melinda, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Tell me a little bit about what you do here at the department. Okay, well, I'm a wildlife diversity biologist. I've been with the agency 30 years now. And uh, we, those of us in the wildlife diversity, we are responsible for the fish and wildlife that are not hunted or fished or harvested in any way, which is a little over 800 different species in wow. the state. So it's, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, in addition to that, the wildlife diversity program is involved in watchable wildlife opportunities. So uh, we're active in the Great Plains Trail of Oklahoma at Hackberry Flat. We have programming and tours that go out of that. And then there's this program called the Salmon Bat Watch. Absolutely. <laughs> and I have been and it is phenomenal. Oh, it's amazing. And we've been doing that for a long time. Right. We Doing the math, I figured this is our 23rd year. Wow, that's great. Well, we're going to visit a little bit more about Selman uh, later, but uh, talking about bat research, and that's yes. another big part of what you do. Absolutely. In fact, it started with the Selman Bat Watch program when we purchased the Selman Bat Cave. After watching the Mexican Freetail Bat, which is, is the star of our show there at the Selman Bat Cave, um, it became obvious that there's a whole lot of amazing things about bats and that each species is different than another. And at the same time, um, nationally, there was an, an increase in bat conservation efforts. So we were just right there with everyone else. And where we used to have to put up mist nets, and you just hoped that you were putting up the net in a place where bats would funnel through and, and hopefully get entangled in the nets to evolving to where we use now the acoustic surveys. And Spavanaugh Hills GMA was really the first place in the state that we did this, right? That's correct. And what made that such a great place to start is uh, about 10 years before we had conducted surveys with those mist nets at Spavanaugh and captured a lot of different bat species and so it was natural to now go to acoustic and 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 just add to that information. We're now going to catch up with Tony Crawford at the Spavanaugh Hills GMA as he's conducting one of these bat acoustic surveys. <laughs> You can see where this is more open and the, versus the timber, we uh, did some aerial herbicide on it and we killed this timber back, which we created a lot more edge, a lot more food, um, tons of forbs, which creates uh, tons of a uh, food source, majority of the food source for the white-tailed deer. And also, this also creates a brood and rear and habitat for the, the turkeys and the quail. Uh, here on the Spavanaugh Wildlife Management Area, uh, it was established in about early 1940s. Uh, it was actually started as a state game refuge to restock deer in Oklahoma. Like many wildlife managers and stewards of the land, Tony Crawford takes great care in the habitat and wildlife he watches over to ensure that the resource is healthy and accessible by all who enjoy it. Uh, now, we do a lot of archery hunting on this area. Uh, for rifle and uh, muzzleloader, you can do, we do draw out hunts, we do an adult rifle hunt, and then we do also two youth hunts. Uh, one's muzzleloader, one's youth rifle, and uh, we get utilized really hard for those, those seasons. In addition to the usual mammals that call Spavanaugh GMA home, Tony has taken a keen interest in another type of mammal as well, bats. Okay, we're here at this location, what we call the uh, Groundhog Hollow Cave. Uh, this is one of the uh, caves that uh, we utilize on the area that the bats actually are using. Uh, and also in these caves, we got them closed off to the public for protection of the caves and also for the protection of the bats. Tony is one of a handful of area managers that have taken part in a new method of studying bats. Using sophisticated software and smart devices, researchers can now gain a better understanding of the flying mammals that inhabit these management areas. One of the reasons why we're doing this type of survey is try to get more 
more inf information about the uh, the non-game species, especially our bats, uh, especially some of them are the uh, greater concern. We have some endangered species that utilize our wildlife management areas and some are threatened species. Uh, with us doing habitat work, uh, we can combine using this type of survey, not only for the bats, for the deer, for the turkey, but we can put it all together and see if what habitat work we're doing is affecting them, it's helping them or not. Uh, it's just another something, extra research that we can apply to our wildlife management uh, skills. Some of the type of species of bats that utilize the area will have the big brown, uh, little brown, uh, the eastern red bat, the silver hair bat, uh, what the tricolor bat used to be call, commonly called the, uh, the pip. Uh, then recently now, uh, with doing the survey, I've actually got a Mexican free tail bat, and then our concern, species of concern, our threatened species, or endangered species, is our, our gray bat, and then our northern long-eared bat. Today we're here at the uh, Spavanaugh Hills Wildlife Management Area. Uh, we're going to be conducting a, a bat acoustic survey on the WMA. We started about a little over a year ago. Uh, we're going to be using this uh, mini iPad and it actually has a little module in it it's called, from the Wildlife Acoustics. Uh, it registers the uh, echolocation from the bat and uh, it will give us a species of bat that gives us two of them but mainly gives us one uh, for the pulse reading. Uh, it gives us a GPS location. Uh, we're going to be able to uh, be able to go back to our Google Drive and be able to see it on the Google Earth. What we're looking at here is some of the recordings that we've done on these surveys. Uh, this is actually one of them, and it'll show the echolocation of that specific bat that came through. Uh, you can look right here where it's yellow. You tap on it, and it'll show your specific bat, with, which that showed the eastern red bat. Uh, What's well, kind of a cool, cool uh, technique about it, it gives you two different bats, but they'll show the pulse reading higher for one of them. And then also, if you go back here to another menu, you can go to a GPS view, which would be of the WMA, the GMA portion of the Spavano area. There, right there is over about a year's worth of uh, documentation of this research we've been doing. Each stop we go to is every half mile. And we'll listen for three minutes. And we'll, once that three minutes is done, we'll move on and continue on to our next stop. And we have about a 17 mile route that we do on the GMA portion. Before we was able to use the modern technology, we used uh, traditional methods. Uh, now with this new style, we're able to be mo more mobile uh, versus the old way where it's we're just stationary and we could only do one location at a time. This is a, a topographical map of the area of the Spavanaugh. We're at, we're right now, we are at the refuge headquarters. We're going to be going up here about a couple miles and we'll start right through this gate and this will be the route that we follow through right here every half mile we'll stop. We'll come all the way down to this point, we'll stop here, we'll turn around and come back to this point and what we are doing is we're trying to get all the different types of the habitat that's on the, the GMA because over here majority of the area is uh, Ozark Flint Hills up and down. We have a prairie style in this area, so that way we can hit both of the areas, well, both different types of habitat. first location uh, what we do is before we get started we're about close to half an hour before before dusk uh, I'll take a relative humidity our temperature our wind speed and our percent of cloud cover before we start and once I do that then we'll start our three minute uh, session on our survey route uh, we're going to start the survey right now As we start right now, usually when you first start out, not as many bats are flying, but as it gets darker, more species will come out a little later. So hopefully here in a little bit, we'll start catching a lot more bats flying, more activity. And it, that's one reason why we flip flop back and forth on a route survey, uh, starting location points. That way we can get different locations and uh, 
try to catch different bats at different times. Well, that stops the first three minutes. Uh, we didn't get anything at this stop, so now we're gonna move on to our next half mile stop down and see what we can get on the next one. Uh, we've already done about five stops. This is probably our sixth stop right now. And so now our bats are like that get out late a little bit later when it's more dark, they're gonna start flying now. So hopefully this point on, we should start having bats at each stop. Uh, right here is the echolocation coming up. There's coming, here comes a bat. It's coming through where the echolocation is getting caught on the recorder. And here pretty quick, I'll be able to show you what bat it is and it was an evening bat. What this uh, modular up here is doing, it's actually uh, listening, it's got a speaker inside of it and a recorder. Uh, as a bat comes by, bats do an echolocation, uh, it can actually read it and it'll come up on the screen, we'll be able to see it when the bat comes by and then once it, about 10 seconds, uh, it'll ID it for us, tell us which bat it is. And right now we're getting a little disturbance right here is mainly from the insects out here, but you can regulate that inside the settings and everything. So, so we just saw one, but now we're here, here we go, he's coming back. It was an evening bat. One of the cool things about uh, being out here on the surveys at nighttime, uh, whether it's doing this bat survey or doing our annual deer spotlight surveys, we're out here, we're getting here the insects, we're getting here actually in the background, we got some coyotes going, howling right now. So it's just kind of a unique part of the job. You get to listen to all this stuff that we have here in Mother Nature. It's an eastern red. The gray modus. That's our endangered bet for the area. There's an app on this uh, mini iPad. Uh, where this automatically stores the info for us. And then when we go back to the office, uh, we can upload it to the hard drive. Uh, we can put it down, download it to Google Earth in a KLM file. And then also uh, I'll uh, compress it to a zip file and to put it to our team drive uh, for all of our WMAs that we've started that's doing all this, these, uh, this research. What's really cool about this, uh, doing this type of survey, we can upload all this information to a Google Earth. Uh, we can zoom in on it also, and it'll show us all the uh, the routes that were done on the GMA portion. We can keep on zooming in here, and we'll actually have our survey routes just for this Spavanol GMA here. And then once we do that, we can click on one of these icons, and we can bring up the species of the bat, the time, the date, the longitude, latitude, and next we can go to each stop and we can figure out exactly which one it is. It's like here it was January 7, 2019, 7.17 p.m. and it was a uh, gray bat. With us collecting this information that we're just now utilizing uh, with us, and we just have a little over a year's worth here just on Spavanol. Uh, we're actually established about five other WMAs throughout the state, throughout the region. Uh, to be able to start doing this. Uh, hopefully someday this will be on all WMAs. We'll be able to utilize this for our research uh, where we can say the bats are fluctuating, the population's going up or down. Uh, if any of our habitat management is affecting the bats, 
Uh, plus, it not only affects them, but it could be affecting bird species, any other game or non-game species as well. Well, Melinda, as with anything, over time you hope that technology advances and things improve, and, and that's certainly been the case with how you all conduct these studies, right? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> the, the very first bat detector, they were called bat detectors, uh, that, that we used was actually a transistor radio made in Belgium. <laughs> Uh, after World War II, they had a stockpile of these transistor radios, and they, uh, this wonderful engineer uh, converted them to bat detectors. Um, after that, we have something like this. Uh, this is a Petersons, and where the original one, you diddled the dial, and when you picked up the echolocation, click, 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 uh, then you, you would have to read the dial on the side, the number, and try and guess what that number is. <laughs> well, then we thought we'd died and gone to heaven when this came along, and you still have to kind of diddle the dial, but you can actually see the number displayed, and as soon as you would hear the echolocation, you would note you know, what number that is, and then you would dial up and back until you can get an understanding of the range, but you had to do it really, really fast. Yeah. Okay, so you move forward now, maybe, let's say, eight, nine years, and we get this wonderful, um, actually even less expensive device where you use a, it, it, originally it was Apple devices, now there's Android, is all you can also use, and you attach a module, and this is now your, basically your bat detector, but now it's recording, you can visually see, as you saw with Tony, the, the actual echolocation, and then by George, it'll identify the bat species for you. Oh. As with Tony, that you know, he's conducting bad acoustic surveys. We now have over 12 wildlife management areas. They have their own equipment uh, to conduct the surveys. And let me tell you, this would not be possible without mm -hmm. a donation from, uh, annual donation from the Oklahoma City Zoo. Mm -hmm. They um, use their, what they call their conservation funds from their Roundup program. And their donation helps us purchase the device, the module, and the data plan. Um, and this, this goodness is going on all across the state. Man, that's great. Now we talked earlier about the Selman Bat Cave, and, and that has been really very much your pride and joy and kind of one of your pet projects over the years. <laughs> yes, it has. Um, we have, you know, like I said, 23 years, I still have not been able to find the words that describes what you're seeing for something that has been going on the same way for at least 100 years, I'm way more than that. But to be able to still see something like that is so amazing. And uh, we've had I guess at this point we've had over 15,000 visitors to see that. We've had 14 different states and four countries that came specifically to see the bat watches. Wow. Um, it's, it's been amazing. This year we've got someone coming from Alaska. Is that incredible? Making their trip just to do this. Wow. So. Well, I have been, and if you haven't, it is definitely a must-do thing here in Oklahoma. It's such a rare opportunity to be able to have your amphitheater there and people are seated and they're just flying literally right over your heads. Yes, it, on, on a really good night, yes, they're right over our heads. They are different from night to night, from year to year. Uh, some years we have the red-tailed hawks come in and some years we don't. So it's, <laughs> even we don't know what to expect from night to night. It's truly a live performance. It Anything really can is. happen. It's why I turn gray every <laughs> summer. So yes. Well, we had a chance to, uh, to shoot a little video one time here yes. recently. Uh, and uh, it, it is truly a spectacle that you've, you just really have to make time to do with your family.
The Mexican free-tail bat is Oklahoma's official state flying mammal. This big yellow blob area here represents a huge area that has what we call karst topography, just a fancy word that means uh, rough, rough uh, topography, exposed rocks, has caves, cave systems, sinkholes, crevices, collapsed boulders, all of that, okay, in this huge area. And there are a lot of caves in there. Only 17 natural caves, though, meet the criteria to serve as a cave for, uh, a maternity cave for the Mexican free-tailed bats, the pregnant ones, which, and then, four, and only four of them occur here in western Oklahoma. But you can see the spread here. This is why the Oklahoma Wildlife Department purchased the Summon Bat Cave back in 95, so that, this cave is always going to be protected. These little mammals, these little bats, are truly flying mammals. So they have to flap their wings 12 times per second to fight gravity so that they can have sustained flight. These bats do indeed need to eat at least half their body weight in insects each night just to maintain their health. So let's just assume that we have half a million Mexican free-tailed bat females arrive here. That equals 10 tons of insects each night that they're eating. Melinda, as I said before, I've been to your presentation and watched those bats come out and it is an incredible experience. I wish that every Oklahoman could experience it at one point or another. So how do they have an opportunity to be a part of it? Well, there's a registration process that begins late May, usually just right after the Memorial Day, Monday Memorial Day. And there's a uh, registration form that they can get on our, off our website. They have X number of days to mail it in. And then we actually conduct a drawing. It's such a popular event. Wow. And um, we have a limitation of, of how many we can take each night. Um, if some, once we're closed, we're closed, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But uh, t if you want to receive advanced notification of when the registration period opens, the very, very best thing to do, and the most amazing, I think, thing to do, is to subscribe to the free uh, monthly e-newsletter called The Wild Side. Mm -hmm. And it will let you know when the registration period opens. But in addition to that, it let, gives you uh, information about other watchable wildlife events in the state, about research, like the bat research going on in the state, and some things you can do with your family uh, for, with the, in the great outdoors. So it's, it's well worth subscribing to. Well, I hope that 
Melinda and Tony's enthusiasm has also got you excited about Oklahoma's incredible diversity and especially the incredible numbers and species of bats that we have here in our state. Hey, thanks for joining us. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma. Thank you.